Sybil named Sybil Lai. Mm -hmm. So Sybil Delai attempted to blow up miscarriage fire seven months after her skull was rebuilt. It was late autumn in Markville, and that meant everyone had to carry a hoodie on them all the time, because wind chill sometimes occurred. Markville was awkwardly 29% repopulated. Some neighborhoods had electricity, some didn't. There were four grocery stores and 17 hardware stores for 145,000-ish people. Hard to get a real camp for migrant labor, migrant labor, and nomad punks, and caravanners occupying all the cracks. Sid had recently started ditching out of her mental health weekly sessions at People's Hurricane Relief Org. Her brain was working at least good enough now that she was beginning to feel that the parade of first year psych interns didn't have that much more to offer her. As far as she remembers, she had been born like this just seven months ago. There was no cure for traumatic brain injury, and she might just have to live out the rest of her life. As with most of a brain, with its scattered rushing and thoughts compounding into a dominant, abominable, abominable <coughs> delusions and plans, she quickly resolved to work with it and own that. For every instance when she forgot where she was and what she was doing, for every time her brain turned off before she had a chance to hit save, and then power back on, she's woken up in the harbor store, wandering, 71% abandoned, new downtown. She retained an archive of trade and skill that seemed completely independent of her personal day-to-day -day memory. Though how well her skill memory had survived was really yet to be tested. Miss Carriage Fire was about Miss Delai's age. She was also about her height, thin as a coat hanger, as if she'd never eaten in her life. She probably had more really nasty cheap tattoos than Sybil. She had the crest of the city of Moorville on one hand and a giant pentagram dug over her heart. And her eyebrows were gone and she had newer better ones aimed higher up. Sybil Delia had done that too many years ago. It made sense at the time. There's an underground sorority of these people with no eyebrows. And it's all these weird young punk girls in the late 270s or whatever year that was, grasping the pick of the torch of Betty Davis. You know, not like either of these two are big Betty Davis fans or anything like that, but Betty knew stuff about eyebrows. And they had showmanship. They had faces they designed themselves. They were expected to be looked at with lingering crazy phrases. One part turned the century traveling service clown, one part early the mid-century Hollywood starlet, one part came of course doll. <clears throat> one part tattoo magazine model and one part dirty cartoon character and one part war paint, a sprinkling too much time on my hands. A miscarriage fire, they said she was falling in Harris to a carriage maker, one of the suppliers of vehicles drawn by horses, which to this day clock between the cars along noisy packed streets of Mortville's crumbled Parisian quarters. They're conducted by coachmen in tall top hats to give tours of promised sightings of the haunts of pirate ghosts, and kids yell ghost threats at them. Beware the haunted coffee shop, the unwashed dead, there are legion. And they tell the rumor that the carriage fire was born from her mother in one of those flopping carriages. She burst out into the world, and the coachman rattled from seeing a delivery in the cab, knocked over an oil lamp in the olden days, and the carriage burst into flames. And thus a flaming carriage was how Miss Carriage arrived the first time she arrived anywhere. Now that is a hearsay rumor. And Sybil does not listen to rumors, and neither should any respectable person, because gossip is crude. Gossip is crude and becoming and implicably malicious, and low and ugly, and Sybil does not partake in gossip. It's a pastime of the spiritually impoverished, classless people. And Sybil Delia is usually mostly, always, way too classy to stoop to strip mining her friends for gossip. But regardless, Sybil believed in carriage is carriage of fire. Her strict moral stance towards feeling repulsion and the presence of gossip did not alter the fact that she felt bound to stand by the beliefs that she liked the best. Sybil believed Miss Carriage could probably call a flaming horse carriage to draw her any time she needed to travel on official business. As it is, Miss Carriage mostly seemed to appear and disappear. She was never anywhere long. She showed up fleetingly and randomly and rarely. And the first time Sybil even met Carriage, it was just five and a half months into the flood. 
The night of Carriage's marriage, she'd gone by in a big wedding dress and stopped to talk with a terrible, filthy squatter punk kid, riding by carrying a chicken. I was Sybil. Sybil had found a mini phantom rooster wandering in the flood and was trying to force it to be her pet. He was about half the size of a loaf of bread and exactly as smart as half the size of a loaf of bread. <clears throat> they didn't exchange names, but Carrie said she liked Sybil's chicken because it reminded her of her old chicken. And then she said, you're like, excuse me, I've got to go get married now. And then she disappeared for 10 months and came back with a baby. Sid did some research and discovered that Carrie was a big player of the up-and-coming tiny dingy theater that stood next to the bridge out of Mortville. The bridge was next to a neighborhood with little shoddy wooden houses that all loomed and it loomed all suddenly large and heavy and industrial, this little neighborhood of tiny houses. A drawbridge with channel locks for letting the cargo ships through the industrial canal into the rail yards. If you went across and led in carriages a lot, she had a little quarter acre with a half collapsed house on it that she might fix up maybe one day, where she lived in two old circus buses with her husband, Big Mike, and their new baby, Automat Sandwich Fire Pile. You see, her name is last name is Fire, and her husband is Big Mike Pile. So of course they named the baby Automat Sandwich. Firepower. Firepower? Firepower. There were rumors the carriage went off the handle out there. Her dead boss was her dead dead. Sid's friend MK had moved into carriage's other bus a few months ago now that she was working as a mosaic tile mason living with her girlfriend who was working on a 247 hallucination cataloging project. Hallucination cataloging project. <clears throat> It was either too fun or impossible, depending on the day, and MK had the living room pantry bus all to herself in return for quelling Carriage's unpredictable rages. Mostly Carriage would spend her days committing the entire place to memory, singing, reading, avoiding ever seeing anyone, except for Big Mike and the baby, and occasionally MK. And MK would just haunt and process, and, or no, she, MK, she just haunt and process at her. Sometimes Carriage would be curled up in a funk, imploding, if she ran out of distractions, if she had used up all her clothing for the day, she'd just sit there like a toaster with soapy on the edge of the bathtub. If disturbed, she'd pull an inverted implosion, turning anything in her long, skinny arms reach into flying shrapnel. MK's other job was to run to Miss Mary's thrift terrier thrice a week for more dishes. Sid attended a number of Carrie's performances, admiring her from the distance, but it wasn't until a few months after Sid came out of the hospital that they talked again. The second time Carriage and Sid met was in the Drawbridge Theatre bathroom after Sybil had witnessed Carriage perform three Chantist style numbers with no accompanying music but eight backup singers, including their mutual friend Miss Aggression, the go go dancer, Miss Susan Fortune Teller. Carriage cornered Sybil as she dipped out of one stall into another, acting suspicious in a completely unrelated way. Hello. I've seen you around for a while and I just wanted to come up here and formally introduce myself. She said, slowly locking her eyes and rationing around like a rack of candy, and then she was simple, neat and clean, like a long, lovingly sharp and long knife, plunged with ease right between Sybil's eyes. Sybil's eyes were green like algae. Carriages were Texas blue, so intense they knocked her off balance. I'm, I'm carriage fire, Miss Carriage fire. Sid had to steady herself and grab her heart to keep from rejecting out of her chest. Both of them in the same room, I unnerved everybody else, so I should have nerved both of them. It was as if it was an alternate reality version of herself, and broken into this reality to warn her of a cataclysm that she had to prevent in the future something. With her genius, a plum and cavalier wit, Sybil stammered, well, well, I'm Sybil Delight. Uh, formerly in the house of Five Gallon Bucket, I like your singing, you look amazing. Her Shanta's bit had been the second bit on stage tonight at the Drawbridge Theatre, Mutations of the Apocalypse Variety Show. And there was Carrie, stopping the toilet, scurrying out of her own theatre, escaping out of only 14 more acts to the show. Sid knew there had to be that she had the new baby, but leaving her only show after only 15 minutes in, she looked remarkably healthy, fit, and skinny, with a nice tight flesh for just having had a baby. She probably never eaten anything either. She probably never eaten anything ever. 
Sybil knew it was her own fault, acting in uncouth or rudely standing in the bathroom stall, holding a joint cheap and smoking with her boy Piper. Not that he was her boyfriend or anything, but a faggy squatter probably she ran around causing trouble with. Damn it! She had offered it to her? The way both Sybil and Carrie had acted, obviously, neither of them knew what to do in the bathroom beyond introducing each other, and it was way too important to fuck this up. So Sybil stood there acting like she was trying to compose, and then handed the joint to Piper and shoved him into the toilet stall and pushed the door closed on him. Carrie looked like she just anxiety tacked up in her mouth a little bit. The frightening blue of her eyes turned to saturated to gray for three seconds. She gulped, and then her eyes came back. Well, be off. So, uh, so soon? Aren't there like 14 more performances? And I know I'm missing one right now because I'm hanging out in the bathroom. But uh, yes, she said with absolute decisiveness. I, I absolutely must get off to you know, well, good night. And then she turned and she sped walk off back at the lane beyond the theater. And Sybil stood there watching her disappear. I was really great to have She almost quietly was useless. So she yelled it, which maybe Carrie heard or not. It was pretty smooth. It was charming. It was pretty smooth. That was great. There was no smoke or clopping hooves now the carriage shot always arrived. <clears throat> there was no smoke and no clopping hooves now. But the carriage always arrived in the park and between an increasingly hot, fiery red and mohawk, tucked it over her forehead. So it's so short that it never got in her eyes. <laughs> She had black hair once, and then she and Sid would look like sisters and be mistaken for each other around the court a bunch of times. Sid Carrie had the eyes of blue flame and white. Sid's were a swamp green, the same color as a shell. Now, as already noted, Sybil did not usually partake in the rumors. But in the hope of getting better and close to Carrie, she made an exception and attempted to see the rumor that she happened to be a bus mechanic. Which was sort of true. She'd done this welding and precision metal parts machine. Super tank kind of building maintenance thing. It was all from the, you know, tattoo shop. The tattoo shop, where she only ever did two tattoos, the one on herself. But true or not, it did no good. She started tipping into obsession. She started stalking carriage about, just to catch glimpses of her and try to understand the closest thing to an uncannily alternate version of herself in her. It was not her fault she had a twitching eye for carriage. She knew her well and sometimes simultaneously had no damned idea who she was, but treated this as a circular incongruity that drove her into a mania. Life is short and deadly, she told herself, and I have the right to dig for answers. She spent time studying old theatrical theater flyers on the walls of bars. Once in the apocalypse variety show, carriage had been billed as the only biological female to ever perform a one all male burlesque crew, the pugnacious dandy. Sid slowly and patiently thrilled to people for information on Carrie, cautiously only asking one question, maybe two in a day maximum, so no one would figure out what she was up to. Even with a baby at home, Sid was still with, wait, I mean Carrie. <laughs> Even with a baby at home, Carrie still ran the swinging carefree bachelorette life as hard as Sybil, showing up at all the parties for eight minutes, then running out the front and jumping into a flaming carriage and being whisked away with a flopping and flaming horse food. Or more often rolling off usually on a cruiser bicycle with a basket full of plastic flowers all over it and red streamers on the handlebars. Supposedly, Sybil discovered that Carrie had another son. When barely dropped out of high school, a gal named Crystal Powers, who ran a tavern in the bywater, Sybil sought Crystal out to experiment with a pity on her and trying to get close to carriage. Crystal was also a small time distributor for a couple of small drug companies, so Sib could seek her out in that pretense. Crystal Powers was totes in the Sibyl, who was obviously her exact type, exactly, exactly. Right? Where was I? But even though the single mother of a haunting wounded nine year old could also have a strong box full of recreational vitamins, and runs a tavern might initially sound like a possible, hottest possible hookup, but I decided it wasn't it. I was, I don't know. <laughs> but like, Sid didn't want to fuck. She just needed to get a carriage in order to jump her battery off the most compatible soul she could find. And she tried to have sex a couple of times with some punks, and it was disastrous. Who needed to have, a, who needed to have an attention span for sex? <laughs> right? I don't know. Where, what was I doing? <laughs> 
Who didn't need to have attention span for sex? She wasn't going to give me orgasm. She wasn't going to have it. Even though she'd been off her moans, she'd been off her moans and meds for like seven months, way longer than seven months. Instead of fucking Crystal, she got to the routine of begging mud shoveling gigs for cash. Yeah, you know, like ten, like ten, fifteen bucks an hour. Mud. It's mostly water. And, uh, instead of fucking Crystal, she got into the routine of begging mud shoveling gigs for cash to go sort grass off Crystal so she could marvel at nine year old half carriage who seemed awkwardly bright and weird already. She hated it when Crystal Towers would taunt her boy about how his other parent was obviously absolutely too crazy and erratic to give any use as far as money or responsibility or parenting crap. Eventually, the stocking paid off, and Sid and Carriage started to get closer. They went swimming. In this strange secret gay resort club they stuck in, it was tucked into the little 12 by 4 block area that had been 88% repopulated just east of downtown. And Sid had come to from a blackout one day, and Carriage was telling two girls off of the nerd tattoos weren't country club members. <laughs> a really big drink, but umbrellas and stuff. Like multiple skewers of pineapple. And oh my god, Carriage swam naked, because <clears throat> there's no reason she couldn't. Sid kept her little micro shirts on. She was uh, feeling a little modest. I'm not, I don't actually have my fly down, I just have like uh, another pair of pants. I'm wearing like, this goes on forever. It's, a, it's an infinity fly. <laughs> it, it technically just goes and goes and goes. She had no damned idea what Carriage did for money, acting in an independent theater scene that came at least a little enough money to live in a broken down bus in the outskirts of town. There had been a rumor that she was thinking of getting out there and grabbing her little family and heading out to California. There had been this other rumor that Carriage and his fag named Cowgirl Johnny had teamed up after the great storm flood of 283, gotten together on a furious spree, sticking up gas stations on the road out of town while the city police were still recovering from the worst devastating storm in over two centuries. And all the remote gas stations had been easy picking. It was just a terrible sick rumor, of course. I mean, no, that could possibly be true. Sybil didn't exactly have any visible means of support either. She had pretty fine, she was uh, almost rich. I have a mansion. So I never wanted seven bucks to my name. You know, after seven months of being unable to see, talk, use my left arm to grow the bathroom properly, the, the house got repossessed and all that. I don't know if I can shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it works. I mean, up the in time and place we live, there is no money for us. We get by fine, better than fine, quite well, in fact. It's only kind of sick self-torture to want anything too out far outside of all of this. Carriage didn't seem like she's free of trouble. Nobody is. And so don't, so don't whine like you think you're special. Carriage kept haunting Sid's pet. The obsession ate everything else and made her useless. Over a week, she waited for understanding to make its way around all the scar tissue in her brain, which should have happened already. And it didn't. It didn't even make an inch more sense after days or weeks, not a micron. Not an iota. Carriage was her impossible spectral alternate universe sibling. Even if she was crazy bipolar, with crippling anxiety, and had a husband and a child, and maybe definitely lived on a bus. Whatever. Sid herself was couch surfing a pile of used lumber in a woodshed right at the moment. But other than that, anything you could say about Sid, you could have said about Miss Carriage and vice versa. Except Sid didn't want kids. Or did she? Do I have to do that now? Is that part of the answer? Anyway, that's why Sid decided she had to blow her up. Probably this new desire to build and plant explosives upon the people who captivated her was a symptom of excessive leisure time. But Sid's plan to blow up this carriage fucked up really horribly, embarrassingly. She finally decided to do it when Miss Carey was appearing at this one play and this minor big deal because it was about the lives of art school dropouts in the early days after the flood. It had had its run extended for two weeks of nightly show. Sid went to at least part uh, to at least part of nine of those. I got like three more pages. Carriage was playing a slacker hustler grifter running a feng shui hustle four months after the flood who was more emotionally raw than she let on. She nailed that part too good. 
The third time she saw the place, it went afterwards to drink with some of the other squatter girls, squatter kids, at the cowgirl tavern next to the theater. Carriage was already there, sitting alone at the end of the bar, drinking a milk, looking alone into her milk, with her head shaved, her little red tuft up front, and the other little one in her neck. She'd totally seen Sid come in, was pretending to be really busy, watching herself stir her milk with her straw. Sid went over to her in a beeline. Miss Kara Junction, be better. She blurred, watching her performance was like getting beaten up in a parking lot. Carriage laughed and then stopped stirring and pulled the straw out of her milk, holding it right over the grass, glass and leg and trip. Mm. You know you're beautiful, right? They both just stood there staring at each other for a really long second. You, 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 you're fucking beautiful, said Sybil loudly and antagonistically. No, 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 you're beautiful, Carriage corrected her, sounding kind of pissed off. Oh, yeah, well, you're soul-crushingly gorgeous, said Sib, and then Carriage was like, yeah, whatever, pop. She scrunched up her face in frustration. Just then, she saw her friend across the room who'd been there the entire time and ran over them, calling her name with her milk in one hand, the other hand, putting a straw of milk on the floor. So then Sid decided for certain talking with her was no good. She'd have to actually carry out her plan and use the bomb instead. This is what Sid wrote in a card that was stuck in the bomb. She went straight back to her woodshed and started making. Every time I see you, it's like walking into a lit cigarette. You probably frighten me and that's why I'm blowing you up. The card was attached to a gasoline can taped to a lamp battery, a digital counter, and a detonator. It was rigged so when the card was taken off to read, the timer would click on and start ticking. But the data would actually just keep counting around in circles. The bomb wouldn't go off by the timer. It would only go off if you did anything to stop it from trying going off. Tamper with the timer or break any of the 16 little nonsense circuits, and it would flip an automobile turn signal thing and ignite the detonator and that would set up a mini flash bomb pack and pack of cherry bombs stuffed in the poor spout of gas can. And that would go down inside the gas can and shoot sparks and fire in there. And it made it from odds and ends and a few runs to the new hardware store and the total cost was maybe like $35, not counting the gasoline. It was finished in time to ambush Carriage at her last night of her big deal play. Sib sat in Cowgirl's bar next to Carriage's theater to arm the detonator. Once it was armed, she went and slipped the package to Carriage via the stage manager. From her stool at the bar, even through the music from the jukebox, she could hear the play's final act bubbling over confrontations and climaxes. Sitting there with a the whiskey lemonade, she connected the bomb's power server by pulling out a backwards dead man and switched to arm it. And then she heard this click she wasn't supposed to hear. <laughs> She knew she had kind of just irreversibly triggered the detonator. It took three seconds to ignite the cherry bomb stuck down the spout of the gas can and then fall down the tip. It all fell down time worm hell, 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 oh god, hell no. The bar froze and time slowed down. The same note just hung and played out of the jukebox. And Sid watched as every electron leapfrogged up one atomic valence starting from the two six volt lamp batteries and going into the clock. Little electrons leapfrogging over each other, going into the clock and into the card and into the turn signal, which theoretically could only be tricked by pulling out the card. Except she wired the detonator to the antecedent of the blob of stray solder applied with a cheap ass $9 soldering iron with an unruly tip. Simple might as well just grab the detonator wires and wrap them around the batteries. After about one million lifetimes of dread and regret, the tiny filament of outdoor spotlight tungsten ignited a tuft of ultrafine steel wool. The potassium in the cherry bomb fuses began to hiss and spit sparks, and Sid jumped away from the bar, knocking over chairs, and people next to her turning with their drinky faces. What? <laughs> Wondering what her deal was. <laughs> Astrologically speaking, carriage is a second deacon Scorpio. That means the second deacon she has domain over raw mistakes, heavy metals, and astrologically that could have explained what happened and why everything went so terribly wrong. 
in real life, what happened is that Sybil forgot a car, and she bungled the NC and Anna terminals and the car relay thing. And without a multimeter to check the continuity, plus like the lead solder connections were done really sloppy, which come to think of it is sort of a mistake involving heavy metal. Oh, and also gas kind of been empty. In order to make it easier to carry and hard to spill gasoline all over herself, she hadn't filled it with gas yet. So technically, maybe at this stage it wasn't a real bomb. I mean, who would ever make a real bomb? Criminals and terrorists? Neither of which still was in any way affiliated with. I, she didn't want to go to jail. Jail's boring and wretched. Bombs are illegal. Don't make bombs. You would have a really weird crush on someone driving you mentally crazy. <laughs> but it still could have totally exploded and taken out this whole packed theater, a ball of fire that had filled with gasoline, a little filling station across the street. Sid had been hoping she and Carriage could have filled it with gasoline together. Instead, the eight bottle rockets ignited and shot every which way in and out of the gas can, around the bar, crashing into the ceiling and the lights on the pool table. One went inside the piano and shot sparks and to bombed around, making blowing noises and showering the bar. It did not blow up carriage, but the popping and zipping and smoke made the whole bar scream and knock over chairs, running around totally disrupting and closing that in play. It all went as wrong in as many ways as possible. Sib stayed sitting at the smoky, sulfur-smelling bar, sulking into her whiskey for ten minutes, putting the wrapping paper back on her now completely sterilized bomb. You are a fucking dumbass, said Jan Dam, the bartender. So I wish you'd blown up the theater. It's for a bunch of people who want a spot on the Indian Theater Fest. Presenting a play about poor people trying to hustle a living and help old Mortville. For all that, they still snub the very idea of fucking tipping. <laughs> the box office, lights and sound, stage manager, director, all of them. But wardrobe is cool though. Wardrobe used to bartend here, she's cool. Sip took a hand and threw her last four bucks and sixty-five cents in the counter for being so understanding of the cloud of yellow sulfur smoke she filled the bar with. When she slipped into the theater anyways and worked her way back to sound and light, playing to a packed house on closing night, characters on the stage, an even more fierce and hard new character than she'd been when Sip had seen the show the other nine times. I have a package here for um, Miss Carriage Fire, sent from the gutter snipe thing finder production company for closing night. That sounded good, right? The actors are coming off stage now. If you'd just like to go down to the front and hand it to her, the sound tech offered. Uh, I really can't. I've got a car and it's running. And I've got to go do that. That seemed like a plausible excuse for leaving the sound tech with a bomb that would no longer go off, but had already been responsible for interrupting their play. A moderate interruption during the performance, anyways. Right after she'd handed off the sterilized bomb, Carriage came out from the dressing room and was talking to somebody from Independent Theatre Review Magazine, or whatever it's called. Sound and light called over to her, Oh, it's fire! Can I get you over here for a sec? And turning her head just in time to avoid eye contact, Sid crashed out the fire door, not looking back to see if Carrie got her bomb and just flew out the door, jumped on her bike, and pedaled hard as she could with every drop of energy, which actually wasn't that fast, because her bike really sucked, and she only had one arm to steer with, and the street was filled with mud, and there was like garbage everywhere. Three days later, Sid hadn't heard if Carriage even got the ball. Well, of course she did. If nothing else, she would have been told by the 25 witnesses, with all that yelling and firecrackers and smoke in the play was. Technically, Sid had not explicitly failed, Carriage knew that Sid had almost blown her up, and that's how this works. She'd succeed in the other part of her mission, which had been to stitch, a, stitch her thread to Carriage's soul, a thread she had rattled off of her own. Carriage fire had, in fact, caught a fleeting glimpse of Sybil erupting up the back door, and she smiled so hard she almost cried. Sybil's bullshit right down to running away at the end was 111% synchronized with Carriage's own behavioral semantic lexicon. She opened the box immediately and squeaked with delight and she grabbed the car and ran all the weird half threats and the clock came alive and started ticking and there were little tiny sparks of combusting steel. The inside of the box stank of cordite and Carrie inhaled it giggly gleefully. <sighs> Every night since then, even after the Firepile family sold off one bus and drove the other one to California to start a new. 
Miss Carriage Fires kept the time bomb ticking on her nightstand next to her bed, where she delights in bragging to all who ever see it that her evil twin threw her at it this one time. She lived in Mortville, and now she uses it as her alarm clock, because that is just how hardcore at sleeping she is.